It was about April 2009 when I first began getting to know Rosalie or Rosie Bourne who from our very first interactions I would have major warning bells and ignoring such warning bells would become the most detrimental mistake of my life. Although Rosie and I were never technically in a relationship, over the following years she would become one of the closest people in my life. Now Rosie and I first met at one of Latino Groups' events on a Wednesday night at the Arkaba Hotel. Although we had absolutely nothing in common aside from our passion to dance and the fact that she was one year behind me in our social work degrees, we got along like a house on fire. However, by the end of the night, I was sure that I was in the friend zone due to the fact that after a couple of hours chatting inside and moving out to the car park where I leant against the car, she proceeded to stand several metres away from me as we spoke for the next hour or so before parting ways. However, to my surprise, no sooner had I got home, I received a message from Rosie somewhere along the lines of, I like the guy to make the first move, you know. Now I question this basically stating that if you want a guy to make the first move perhaps you should show some interest and position yourself in a manner from which the guy is physically able to make a move as well as providing some form of consent for the guy to make a move such as leaning in a little closer etc. To which Rosie responded, no, it's a game. I'm supposed to act disinterested so that you chase me. Now I thought this was absolutely insane and pointed out the fact that that would be on par with stalking. Now I challenged this in a manner that acknowledged the fact that I've got enough respect for myself and women that if a woman is behaving in a manner which suggests they are only interested in friendship, that it is only respectful for me to treat the relationship as such. Now, although this had set off major alarm bells, I dismissed her insane logic as most likely being ideas that she had picked up through some dangerous date rape promoting advice she would read in some sort of girly magazine. Now, Rosie Bourne is the most dishonest person I've ever met. Now, Rosie was an incredibly confused girl with her silly religious ideas. And my level of uncomfortability grew as the warning bells got louder and louder. Now, although Rosie had had sex several times early in her teenage years, she had joined a virgin club in a religious private school where she had proceeded to lie to her closest friends pretending to be a virgin for over a decade. Now, throughout those early weeks, probably the first five to seven, Rosie had told me, over and over again, literally dozens of times, that she didn't want to have sex and that she was saving herself for marriage. Of course, I was very open with the fact. Personally, I don't really believe in monogamy. I see it as kind of an unrealistic and unnatural, socially constructed institution designed to support labour-based societies. As well as the fact that although I respected her decision not to have sex, that I wasn't willing or prepared to go without her, However, I was happy to maintain friendship and continue falling around on a wider level. However, as things progressed, I found myself becoming incredibly uncomfortable that the situation may become some kind of date rape scenario due to the fact that although on a verbal level, the words I do not want to have sex kept coming out of her mouth, what she was doing was things like lowering herself down onto me and then acting all shocked and pretending it slipped in, like, oh, was that in? It was actually quite embarrassing to watch. I pulled her up on it, you know, like, who are you trying to kid, you or me? We both know what you're doing. Now, if you want to have sex, I'm fine for you to explore yourself. However, if you want to have sex, I need some kind of verbal consent so that we're on the same page that that's what you're doing. And of course, once that was cleared up, she explored herself and found that sex wasn't this evil thing that religion had told her, quite the opposite. Then of course, she was too scared to tell her best friend. It took me literally weeks to convince her that if your best friend disowns you for having sex, she's not your best friend. And of course, when she finally built the courage to speak to her best mate about it, she didn't disown her and was actually really excited to hear all the gory details. 
I recall her being absolutely perplexed over the fact that although that her and her little group of religious friends in their virgin club had come up with these tick box checklists of the dream men that they were going to marry, however she found herself in this situation with me who didn't fit in with absolutely any of her superficial ideals of a husband. However, for whatever reason she was unable to comprehend she was able to open up to me in ways she had never been able to open up to even the closest of her friends. No. Now another extremely good example of just how deeply Rosie's dishonesty filtered through to just about every aspect of her life was when I took her down to the docks at Glenelg for lunch. As we entered the restaurant, she asked whether we should sit inside or outside. And as it was an absolutely beautiful day, I looked outside and said, it's a lovely day, perhaps we should sit outside by the yachts. And did my best to hide my disappointment when she turned around and said, okay, let's sit inside. After sitting down and taking a look at the menus, possibly even ordering, Rosie then looks outside and says, it's a lovely day outside, why are we sitting inside? To which I replied, that's what I said, before Rosie responded, but I thought you wanted to sit inside. And I was like, no, if I wanted to sit inside, I would have said I wanted to sit inside. It's a pretty simple fucking question. Now, I'm still not sure that I've figured out the logic behind this. I assume somewhere along the lines of because Rosie constantly lies and tells people what she thinks they want to hear, that she assumes that's how others communicate and then counters that. I don't really know. But I guess the point is, when you're dealing with someone who operates on that kind of logic on, throughout every aspect of their life on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not hard to imagine how unmanageable it becomes. Now, although all of this was contributing to great concern and the major warning bells with which I had from the start, and was very much out of line with the strong values I developed surrounding honesty, Although I couldn't even begin to comprehend the level to which this affected Rosie, there had been subtle levels of dishonesty throughout my life with, with which I'd had to identify and practice courage around in developing the values around this that I had. The more I got to know of Rosie's story, the neglect she had experienced through her family and the pretentious and judgmental religious environments with which she'd grown up, the more I was able to treat her with love and compassion in attempting to understand the ways in which she had evolved to become so dishonest and do my best to encourage her to practice courage around this sort of stuff. Now, despite all my reasons for concerns, there were things that I liked about Rosie. Once we started having sex, it was actually pretty good, although there was ways in which she would never be able to keep up with my sex drive. And almost like the experience I've heard from many women, Rosie was a bit like a lot of blokes in the sense that once she'd had an orgasm, she pretty much just wanted to roll over and go to sleep. However, aside from that and the fact that I was physically too large for her and would end up hurting her at times, we were otherwise quite compatible. And there were also many ways in which she'd slowly worn me down, in ways in which I was becoming open to her idea of a relationship. To the point that after six months or so, I expressed my willingness to commit to her. However, by the time I'd become willing to commit to Rosie, Rosie no longer wanted a relationship. Over the following months, would proceed to tell me over and over again on almost a daily basis that I was single. However, when I eventually ended up sleeping with someone else, Rosie turned around and claimed that I'd cheated. Now, there was no way in hell that I was going to wear this given the fact that she had so constantly told me over and over again that I was single. However, Rosie would not let go of this, at least for several months until I stopped hearing about it. Now, I remember having many arguments about this over those months and putting it back on her that it was something that she needed to deal with and she had absolutely no right to claim that I had betrayed her when she was the one telling me I was single. I recall telling her on a number of occasions, stop going to your religious mates who have no experience with relationships for relationship advice. It's, you know, if you've got a problem with your car and you don't take it to the cake shop and go down to a normal bar, find a normal woman, 
sit down, tell her about this wonderful guy that you've been seeing and that you've just spent the last three months telling him just about every day that he's single and now he's slept with someone else and that you think he's cheated. And see how long it takes her to knock you off your bar stool. Now, although I would not wear this, I know Rosie did not let go of it for at least three months until I stopped hearing about it. And I suspect Rosie's resentment over this is the most likely reason that I can think of for Rosie justifying later destroying my entire life. Now, despite such problems, we also had a lot of fun. I developed enough of a liking to her to take her down to the Riverland to meet my family. And we went away on other holidays, such as down York's camping, which turned out being a bit of a disastrous adventure. We rocked up on a bulk budget with a $10 tent and the most basic of supplies just to arrive and have the weather turn and get drenched on the first night and got kept awake for half the night by this mouse which had broken into our tent and scared the absolute hell out of us running across our faces before we were able to identify what it was and get it out of the tent. It took several days before we were able to get Rosie to catch her first fish. Unfortunately, at the same moment, I'd hooked onto a kingfish and got overly excited and sort of missed the moment. However, despite all the dramas, it was a great little adventure and worthwhile experience. Although I didn't believe in monogamy, and there were many obvious reasons why we were incompatible, there were still many ways with which my romantic side would come into play, such as the Easter where we'd been going through some struggles, and I ended up dropping a basket on her doorstep and banging on the door before doing a runner, and then, then driving off to different spots and hiding Easter eggs, and then sending little riddle-like clues for her to figure out whilst I hid and took photos of her, finding her easter eggs from a distance before heading off to the next spot and sending her on a goose chase in her easter egg hunt around town. And although Rosie very much appreciated those things that I did, they weren't good enough. She was never really able to let go of her ideas on the way she thought I should express my romantic side. Now, there are many ways in which Rosie was quite controlling in, in manners, which I'm now able to see very consistent with the more subtle aspects of domestic violence. Rosie was very much caught up with her ideas of what a relationship should be, very much tied in with traditional gender roles, such as constantly imposing these ideas of manhood that I should make all the decisions, due to being students who we were both on tight budgets and used to go out fairly regularly to places like the Earl of Leicester where we'd often share one of the huge amazing schnitzels that they used to make as an affordable means of eating out. However, this wasn't good enough for Rosie. Rosie constantly imposed the expectation of not only me taking her out, which wasn't an issue, Rather the fact that she would impose the expectation that I'm the man and I need to choose the restaurant and do all this other stuff that quite frankly I didn't have time to do. As I made clear to her many times, I was quite happy to take her anywhere where she'd like to go. She grew up in the city, knew where to eat out. However, with my studies, I didn't have time to be mucking around, trying to research and look for restaurants to take her out that in most cases, neither of us could afford anyway. Then there was also the aspect that she was constantly trying to sever relationships with people she did not approve of. One of these relationships was my father, who I had a complex relationship with, and there were lines that he overstepped. And between overstepping those lines and the constant pressure put on me by Rosie, I cut him out of my life for 12 months. Now this was due to the fact that he'd got in a pattern where he'd borrow $50 from me every fortnight and this had become routine and was really affecting my ability to manage my budget. So I gave him notice that I could no longer continue doing this and timed it in with his Centrelink loan so he wouldn't be left high and dry. However, on the first week this was to apply, he rang up asking for $200 that I could not afford as I was about to walk into a lecture, to which I didn't respond very well. And of course, once I got home, I discovered he'd broken into my house and stolen all the medications. Neither of us knew Bachata and as students didn't have money for classes or studio space. 
So we examined videos off the internet. During the evenings, we would drive into the city to a car park that was vacant at night and drive up the exit ramps where we choreographed and rehearsed the routine with Rosie's laptop and using the car headlights for light. Now we were competing in the South Australian Bachata Competition held by Latino Grooves which was the state's qualifying round for the National Bachata Competition and was meant to consist of two heats, professionals and amateurs. However, as there was only one professional couple, the professional heat was combined with the amateurs. Rosie did very well for her first competition and we ended up placing third. However, whilst examining the scorecards and the comments of a range of judges from across the country, which provided detailed feedback as to ways in which we could prove upon ourselves as dancers across categories such as technique, timing, musicality, stage presence, etc., I noticed one of the scores had been changed. I believe it had been changed from a 9 down to an 8, however then gone over to look as if it had been changed up from a 7 to an 8. As soon as I spotted the change score, Julia snatched the scorecard out of my hand and put it behind her back. When I argued it was our scorecard and that it had extensive feedback from the national judges, Julia backed into the green room and closed the door going, it's my scorecard. Everyone who approached me after the competition said that it was bullshit and that me and Rosie should have placed ahead of Sam and Becky who danced their entire routine out of time. And that it was blatantly obvious that Julia just wanted her teachers in the National Bachata Comp. However, the most significant thing about this little story is that later the footage of what was predominantly my choreography would be held hostage by Rosie for several months in a manner with which I would be forced to literally beg for a copy whilst Rosie gaslighted me and played me off as the obsessed ex. Around mid-2010, after six years of complete abstinence and sobriety from both alcohol and other drugs, and started questioning whether the problems that I'd experienced earlier in life relating to my ability or inability to moderate my alcohol consumption were more due to the fact of me being young and several other weak arguments to I used to justify testing the fat and I picked up that first drink. Now of course almost immediately I was unable to control my alcohol consumption. Not that that really affected my ability to function. However, it soon got me in a position where I couldn't stop and alcohol was required for me to function. Now this didn't cause too many problems aside from chipping away at my health and creating challenges as far as driving. However, otherwise I functioned relatively well on alcohol and this had very little effect on my academic performance and other aspects of my life. During the second half of 2010, I applied for and was accepted into the Honours Stream for my Bachelor of Social Work. However, after great consideration, I opted to knock back Honours as I saw the final year subjects that I would have to miss as being of greater value to the direction upon which I was planning on taking my career. Towards the end of 2010, a former lover of mine, Stacey, contacted me and invited me over to Melbourne for Christmas. However, I declined out of respect for Rosie, which is something that will come into play later on in the story with the abuse I experienced. Although I'm unable to recall the majority of TV shows she was into, I do know Rosie was completely obsessed with the show Gossip Girl. Based on the name, this was something I had absolutely no interest in. However, as it was something that she was into, I did actually consider buying her a season for Christmas. But in the end, I think someone else got in first. Now, it's only been in more recent years that I've been able to identify the potential significance of this. And although I'm still unable to bring myself to watch such garbage, from what I understand, based on what I've read and the small amount that I've been told, it's an incredibly sick, toxic show about some girl who, who creates this anonymous online figure, gossip girl, who goes around destroying people's lives with gossip. Now, I'd be very interested from anyone who's familiar with the show as to whether gossip girl, being one of Rosie's greatest heroes, 
is likely to have been a significant influence and even inspiration to the gaslighting and psychological abuse that Rosie inflicted upon me and the ways in which she used this to completely destroy my reputation and all aspects of my life. Leading into 2011 for my final year of my degree, I was completely burnt out and was putting great consideration into potential mentors that may be suitable for the direction upon which I was planning on taking my career, which I discussed in great detail with Rosie. Throughout the first half of 2011, whilst burning out on my subject, I exhausted a great deal of energy supporting Rosie throughout the alleged bullying she experienced throughout her first student placement. This is also the same period throughout which I believe Rosie sabotaged my mentorship. Now there was quite a lot going on leading up to the second half of 2011. As I mentioned previously, I sought consultation from the head of the university, Patricia Muncy, in regards to seeking support in supporting Rosie throughout these bully allegations. I recently recalled a coincidence that I believe leads very well into this subject. Now this occurred around about the time that I was helping support Rosie through the alleged bullying she was experiencing throughout her first student placement and leading into the abuse that I experienced. Now this coincidence relates to my professional mentorship which was a huge decision that I put a great deal of consideration into late 2010 and throughout the first half of 2011 which was something that I frequently discussed with Rosie and have good reason to believe she may have sabotaged along with virtually all other aspects of my life. Throughout these discussions, we explored a number of potential candidates that may be suitable for the direction I was planning on taking my career. Now, one of these candidates was a tutor I had for complexity and practice, who I developed a great deal of respect for throughout the first three or four months of the subject, who also happened to be one of Rosie's tutors. Coincidentally, Within a week of sharing my decision to approach this tutor with Rosie, this particular tutor's entire attitude and demeanor towards me suddenly changed. The first sign I recall of this was during a tutorial session where she had been discussing with the group the fact that as a worker you need to be careful not to allow yourself to be manipulated by clients. She then looked at me and added, you also have to be careful of the rogue social worker. Now, I distinctly recall the way she looked at me as she made this statement, almost looking straight through me. It was extremely bizarre and confusing, to the point I was too uncomfortable to even ask her to expand upon what she may have meant by that. Now, this come as quite a shock to me, really. Um, although it was quite a large tutorial group which limited our interaction, there had never been any signs of uncomfortability throughout the first three or four months. It just didn't make sense, you know. I really enjoyed complexity in practice. And, you know, although it was one of the more difficult subjects, I thrive on complexity. I've done exceptionally well in the first two assignments that she'd marked receiving a high percentage credit for the first and a distinction for the second which covered all of the core course content and there was absolutely no logical explanation that I could see at this stage for such a shift in her attitude towards me. I immediately lost respect for her and became too uncomfortable to approach her as a potential mentor which left me unsupported and even more isolated and vulnerable to the gaslighting I was beginning to experience. Now I had to look up the definition of rogue. According to Google, it's a dishonest or unprincipled man. I've added shoe in brackets because I don't believe it's a gender specific character flaw. Now I guess the irony of this is that this particular tutor failed to consider that Rosie Bourne will miss no experience with anything in life except for pretending to be things she's not who loves Gossip Girl and feeding shit in people's ears, is in fact the rogue 
social worker. Now, as this raises some rather complex value and principle-based questions, I don't see any other way of exploring whether or not I'm a rogue social worker, let alone the impact the gaslighting I experienced by Latino Greaves has had upon my career without going right back to the start and exploring my upbringing and early development. The unique action taken by my father and processes which enabled me to overcome great adversity earlier in life, the influence this has had upon my understanding of myself and development of the previously stated character traits, you know, like it's all good and well for me to say that I've consistently demonstrated these qualities over the past 15 years, but it doesn't mean much without an understanding of where they come from and how they have contributed to my success in my relationships and ability to connect more intimately with others and in rising above a range of mental health issues all of which led me to becoming a dancer, which no one expected. And has had a major influence upon my human understanding and aspirations as a social worker. Now, the question of what a social worker is and does is complex enough on its own without even beginning to consider my personal aspirations as a social worker. So to put the former of these in an oversimplified nutshell, well, I think it's worth providing a brief summary of what was put to us throughout the introductory stages of our degrees. Now, the first thing that was put to us was that the ultimate aim of social work is to do ourselves out of a job. Now, that's quite unique. We'd have to be the only profession on the planet, at least that I'm aware of, that's main objective is to do ourselves out of work. So what is our job? Working at the interface between humans and their environments in pursuit of human rights and social justice. Big, broad, complex stuff. Now it was made very clear to us within our first few lectures that if we were there to pursue a lucrative career path that we were in the wrong place. We were given two main career options, direct client service, or activism, whether as employees of organisations or private practitioners. In stressing this point, they made it very clear that in most positions we'd be struggling to make ends meet within organisations that have barely enough resources to keep the doors open to provide the illusion of help for those who don't need it. Now, the university was very critical and upfront in acknowledging education's role in teaching people to conform rather than to think, and the challenges that this presented them in undoing this, and we were strongly encouraged to think critically and challenge the status quo. Now, personally, this wasn't such a great issue due to life experience and the fact that I had spent so much of my education in time out, detention, some places even called it what it was, exclusion. Predominantly for questioning authority in regards to things that simply didn't make sense or had no logic behind them. In introducing and enabling us to practice such concepts, we undertook subjects like philosophy, knowledge and ethics, and sociology, where we were provided all kinds of critiques on all aspects of society, and presented with the complex challenge of providing further critique upon such critiques. Now, coming into an environment where we were so strongly encouraged to think and question everything we think we know about everything, Rather than being told what to think and to conform mindlessly, personally I found this very refreshing, exciting, and for one of the first times in my life, felt a sense of belonging and as if I had found the place where I was meant to be. And while such processes were getting underway in other subjects, we were presented with the complex social issues that we were likely to be working with as social workers, such as inequalities across gender, race, class, etc. 
the impact of prejudice upon Indigenous Australians and minority groups, health across all spectrums from mental through to physical, poverty, homelessness, abuse and violence within families, relationships and on a domestic scale, as well as institutionally sanctioned violence such as our criminal justice system and other aspects of our culture, as well as environmental concerns due to overpopulation and consumerism and many more. However, the most major concern stressed by all of our lecturers throughout the first year of our degree related to our ageing population. We were advised that within 20 years, with some variation between different societies, that everyone would either be the elderly or employed looking after the elderly. Now, I don't know what anyone else in that room was thinking, but that's physically impossible. That's no one to run any other aspects of society. Now, although the lecturers stress this problem in no uncertain terms and were very upfront and honest in their distrust with the government's capacities to handle this situation in an ethical and humane fashion, they were extremely cautious not to speculate about the ways in which governments are likely to handle a situation that without comprehensive socio-economic reform can only lead to a major health crisis, system failure, and ultimately genocide. Needless to say, this, and particularly this, had a complex enough influence upon my career aspirations on their own without considering the influence that the processes I had undertaken and subsequent understanding of myself that I had developed earlier in life had had upon my studies in terms of understanding human nature as well as mainstream models of psychology and other therapeutic frameworks all of which contributed to the development of my own psychotherapeutic framework, which although heavily influenced by my experience with 12-step fellowships, applies modern day psychology into understanding many of the processes within such programs, whilst providing insight into the ways in which the term God is used within those fellowships and providing an alternate variation that removes the religious component of such programs without losing the functional value of such contentious concepts, as well as providing additional alterations to the program to open it up so that anyone can use the comprehensive framework for self-analysis and range of processes necessary in applying that information into self-development throughout time, which I believe offers a great deal of value to society. Now, a combination of that and my broader experience of life had had significant influences upon undertaking a comprehensive analysis of society, examining the development of culture and all social systems, as well as the purposes that these had served under various conditions throughout time, including the pros and cons of these, both within individual societies and in cross-cultural contexts. Up until this point in time, and examining what's changed, the resources we now have and complex challenges we face in contemporary society. And then applying all of this information into formulating an alternate social structure, including reform of all social systems from our political system, our entire economic structure, from the way that we approach employment, welfare and participation in society, as well as our criminal justice system and approach to education, and in promoting a more stable, efficient and humane culture that is more equipped in facilitating the health, well-being and greater human potential of all members of the human species. Now, as it would serve very little purpose to formulate such a revolutionary 
model of social reform without putting great consideration into how to go about introducing such ideas to society my career aspirations at this point in time strongly centered around using my skills as an artist dancer and social worker as well as my experience with life to go into private practice and activism fighting for greater social change with the ultimate aim of building a human service organization structured to provide a holistic range of services and facilitating many complex functions necessary in informing the development of such comprehensive social reform and introducing such an alternate model to society. Then we must consider the strengths and challenges of the position I was in prior to the bullying I experienced at Latino Groves. Now, despite facing many challenges, I was actually in a very good position to proceed with slowly working towards all of this. Prior to the impacts, my experience with gaslighting and psychological abuse at Latino Grooves have had upon my position in terms of health, finances, reputation, socially and professionally access to support and resources, or sexuality. And the complex challenges, this is all created for my security and well-being, as well as my ability and opportunity to achieve my human potential and career aspirations. Now, due to all of this and the conversations we had had on many social issues throughout our degrees, Rosie Bourne was very well aware of my past and the influence that had had upon my value systems, my successes within my relationships, and the fact that I had virtually no conflict with anyone. Don't get me wrong, I'm not gonna pretend that I didn't have complex relationships with all sorts of people, particularly my father. However, the biggest relationship problem that I had, I didn't even know about. And how could I even know there was a problem? I'd always been open about my views on things such as monogamy. And throughout that six months leading up to being played off as the obsessed ex, Rosie and I had had many discussions on topics such as religion as a patriarchal organisation and the role it's played in society throughout time in demonising human nature via fear, guilt and shame in the indoctrination of value systems surrounding sexual desire and orientation, monogamy and marriage, and traditional family structures as institutions structured to serve labour-based societies. Now, from a psychosocial perspective, when examined critically, such culturally imposed value systems surrounding traditional ideas of a relationship can be seen as having all kinds of highly subjective, often unrealistic and in other ways potentially problematic expectations attached to them. Now if that's not complex enough on its own, from a socio-economic perspective the value systems behind such relationships are very much tied in with and institutionalised by legal and religious contracts such as marriage, which is ultimately the culturally sanctioned ownership of another human being and is attached to a whole range of further complex social expectations surrounding the ownership of other human beings in the form of our offspring. And finally, the formation of our economic system around such traditional relationship structures has had major influences upon the cost of living, including the prices of, say, housing, vehicles, a business suit, etc., which have remained relatively consistent in their proportion to the average wage up until this point in time, further contributing to the institutionalised dependence upon such relationships. However, setting aside economic dependence back to the value systems surrounding monogamy and relationships, although there have been major declines in people identifying with religion over, say, the past 50 years or so, many of the value systems 
surrounding relationships, monogamy and sexuality have still carried over into contemporary society. Where these have the potential to become highly problematic is when such belief and value systems are used as excuses to justify prejudice, abuse and violence against any individual or minority group. An example of this may be something like slut shaming, which is a sexually oppressive form of abuse perpetrated by both men and women and most commonly inflicted upon females which is similar to other forms of prejudice and abuse relating to people's sexuality and sexual orientations, although this generally occurs on a less gender-specific basis. Another common and very good example can be seen in cases where people fail to live up to these unrealistic social expectations and value systems in succumbing to their natural sexual desires and commit adultery which is also commonly used as an excuse for abuse and violence. Now, whilst generally speaking in all of these cases, such abuse could be said to have less to do with the behaviour of the victim and more to do with the value systems of the perpetrators. However, even this becomes complicated due to the fact that these value systems can be seen as to opening sex up as being used as a weapon in the form of psychological and even social abuse, in instances such as revenge sex, which is not only used to cause psychological and emotional pain, but often as a means of causing conflict within or even completely severing a relationship with a third party such as a friend or family member. Or perhaps even flaunting or using a new relationship in an emotionally abusive manner. Of course, all of this has further implications for the many people who experience guilt, shame and other forms of psychological conflict due to struggling to repress various aspects of their sexuality and orientation in attempting to live up to these unrealistic socially constructed expectations. Which often has me wonder how many couples are out there who both have hidden sexual desires that remain unfulfilled due to being too afraid to discuss these with one another. Which brings this discussion back to my review on Latino groups. As when I look at all of the facts, it's clear that such value systems played a huge role in the gaslighting and psychological abuse that I experienced at Latino groups. From the most likely motive which I've discussed in previous feeds being her claiming that I cheated on her which I refused to wear due to the fact that she was the one claiming I was single and it was more about her being unable to cope with her value systems. Then the additional motive which fits very well with the way I was gaslighted and played off as the obsessed ex by a number of religious people who obviously don't approve with the fact that I don't believe in monogamy or with my feminist based perspectives on the value systems associated with their insidious patriarchal institution of social control. And finally, the many ways with which she used various aspects of her new relationships in an emotionally abusive manner. Now, even well before the gaslighting and psychological abuse I experienced at the hands of a few religious people, due to the critical analysis with which I had undertaken on religion from both feminist and other sociological perspectives, as well as the studies I had undertaken into psychology and childhood development throughout my degree, I had developed strong professional views surrounding religion, that it should be restricted to R18+, classified as a potentially damaging form of psychological abuse, prohibited from any involvement in education, at least until all content is assessed and approved for age appropriateness in protecting children throughout the most vulnerable stages of their development. Various aspects of which I had touched upon on an academic level throughout assignments leading into this period, which needless to say, I discussed with Rosie. Now to add a few closing comments, I find myself extremely uncomfortable with the politically correct stance our country is taking towards religion, 
which almost encourages the dismissal of anyone who looks at these institutions critically and ostracizes them as being racist. Now, I'm not suggesting that religion should be outlawed full stop. However, I wholeheartedly believe in every child's right to freedom from religion until they reach adulthood and are able to make mature and informed decisions regarding religion. Now, although feminist movements have compelled a great deal of positive social change in terms of women's rights and gender equality, one of the unintended consequences of this is that many of such changes do not always necessarily fall in line with at least my understanding of the principles and essence of the feminist critiques which compelled this change in the first place. The feminist critiques with which I'm familiar didn't see patriarchy so much as something that men did to women, rather unpacked the many complex ways in which both men and women and other systems within society all collectively contribute to the oppression of various aspects of human nature and in the indoctrination of various character traits related to traditional ideas of masculinity and femininity between children of different sexes in the establishment of gender, as well as in the prescription of a range of gender-based norms and social expectations surrounding these, as well as examining the strengths and weaknesses and pros and cons of these in relation to the perpetuation of various inequalities distributed between both men and women and pushing for social change to reduce such inequalities. However, there are many ways with which society, in striving to make everyone equal, can be seen to have lost sight of the quality aspect of equality. One of the major insults that I see to women that further emphasises the undervalued role they played in traditional breadwinner model societies is the fact that as women entered the workforce that working hours were never halved and men encouraged to undertake at least 50% of the, the very significant roles that women once played in our society. Now, whilst that's arguably what should have happened, what appears to have happened is that governments have latched on to women as additional human capital to be exploited with complete disregard to the significance of the roles they once played in society. Of course, one of the incredibly complex negative consequences of this is that these roles are now no longer being fulfilled. Now we are seeing typical family structures where both mum and dad are expected to work full hours, often without being any better off financially. Both mum and dad are burnt out, haven't seen the kids, haven't had any time for themselves, let alone enough time to prepare meals, which is arguably a contributing factor to a growing culture of pre-prepared, over-packaged and single-serving food-like products which are often incredibly unhealthy, not to mention the additional pressures this places on our environment due to excess waste. Now, the potential health impact all of this has extends well beyond unhealthy food, considering factors such as the cultural and social role both the preparation and consumption of food plays throughout many cultures along with the physical, mental and emotional implications of people being overworked as well as people spending more time separated from one another including parents being left with less time for involvement in their children's development which is instead trusted to professionals who have often never left school. And then of course, when something goes wrong with the children, responsibility and blame is thrown back onto the parents. I also see the economic dependence upon relationships as playing a major role in uh, problems with domestic violence in the sense that under current wage structures, many people are often left in a position where they're forced to choose between a relationship or poverty. Personally, I see a great need to restructure our economy to enable people to support themselves and a healthy lifestyle within independent living arrangements on a sole income, as well as having enough time, energy, and financial resources 
to pursue healthy recreational and social activities and their personal development throughout time. Now, the fact that I personally don't believe in monogamy doesn't mean that I am against other people having monogamous relationships if they choose. However, in order to enable this to remain a choice rather than a social obligation, in addition to restructuring our economic system, it would seem beneficial for society to take a critical look at the value systems and social expectations we perpetuate surrounding sex and relationships to enable people to more freely and safely explore relationships and where necessary more fluently transition through relationships in exploring themselves and what works for them. However, what appears to have happened is, in many ways it seems as if, rather than compassion for the ways in which both men and women have been traditionally indoctrinated into these gender roles throughout time and working together as men and women to improve upon all of these systems that, that can be seen as consistently contributing to and setting people up for these commonly experienced problems it would seem that the negative aspects of masculinity are being countered with those same negative aspects and we are seeing more traditional authoritarian approaches being applied in laying the blame back onto individuals and in trying to beat the pain out of people, which never has and never will work as far as I'm concerned. Now, whilst Rosie and I are having these extremely complex discussions around all kinds of social issues that I was very passionate about understanding. She's busy smiling away, nodding, pretending she understands, which I had no reason to question given the fact that she was studying the same degree as me. Although if I'm honest, looking back to the work that I read of hers throughout those couple of years, it rarely exceeded the base core content written and presented in a nice, neat, orderly fashion consistent with her private school education. However, I don't recall any of her work ever going over and above or ever attempting to take a risk and delve into the more complex aspects of society. Now, unlike Rosie Bourne, I actually have some experience in life and wisdom that's come through that. And I presume that she was well aware that I had no intention of approaching my career with anything other than the same level of transparency I do my best to maintain within all of my relationships. Now Rosie was also very well aware of the direction upon which I was planning on pursuing my career aspirations as well as the fact I had absolutely no intention of burning myself out scrubbing the deck on a sinking ship and preserving the status quo in pursuit of her delusional white picket fence religious ideas of a relationship. She was also very aware of my intellectual disabilities and the fact that due to my past I had absolutely no experience looking for work and that although this had all led to the success that I'd had within our relationships that university had shrunk my inner circle down to these six people along with the severe crisis that I was thrown into throughout the last six months of my degree throughout which time she chose to inflict such severe psychological abuse upon me that I'd be left in a critical state literally fighting for my life completely traumatised and isolated. The first of many subtle clues that I failed to pick up on at the time as to Rosie's motives and clear intention to play me off as a obsessed ex came early May 2011 on my birthday when as a present she rocked up and gave me a number of things of personal lubricant along with I think some chocolate and her explanation was, I can't think of anything else you like. Now, I can't say that I was overly impressed at the time and I did feel it was a bit of a lame effort. However, given the fact that, as I've mentioned, Rosie was quite lazy in bed and that even on days where I'm fortunate enough to have sex several times, 
it's still not uncommon for me to end up masturbating a couple of times on top of this. So I guess in a practical sense I didn't see it too much different to receiving socks as a present. And also between over the years having come to a point where I don't place a great deal of significance in birthdays, and with a lot on my plate at the time I didn't really think a great deal of it. However, the significance of this present will become clear as we move into the details of the many ways in which I was gaslighted and played off as the obsessed ex. On the 10th of May, due to some kind of mix-up with the Register of Motor Vehicles, my licence would become expired on the police system, even though according to the Register of Motor Vehicles system, I was not due to expire until the following year. However, I would remain unaware of this for the following months, throughout which times there were several occasions which I was sure that I had drawn attention from police vehicles, that had been unable to get themselves into a position to pull me over. Now, I'm not sure if I actually mentioned that to Rosie. I know I did to a couple of my closer friends. Although I found it odd and it did provoke a certain level of uncomfortability, it wasn't something that was of major concern as I hadn't been involved in anything too out of line. It was something that I could see a number of possible explanations for. Firstly, at some stage after relapsing, I'd started smoking dope, which of course involved purchasing dope from people who may have potentially been under police surveillance. Secondly, throughout my years of recovery, who were often at various stages of attempting to leave all kinds of chaotic lifestyles in the past. Thirdly, the fact that I was driving a WRX may have been enough of a reason for some police to attempt to pull me over. And finally, there was the fact that I may have drawn attention through the nature of the premises within which my father was living, which will become clearer in attempting to detail the circumstances which would unfold in the following months. It was also throughout May, perhaps heading into early June, that one of my closest friends would decide to pack up his entire life and move to Melbourne. On the spare of the moment, with around a week's notice, which would require me to help pack up his entire life after around a decade and shift it into storage. This came at a terrible time for me. Having handed in all my major assignments for most of my subjects, I still had my final assignment for complexity in practice, which out of that entire semester was the one I was most looking forward to. The task of the assignment was to design a program around a particular social issue However, complexity in practice was structured different to a lot of subjects in the sense that its most major assignment was in the middle and the final assignment was and the final assignment was only around a thousand words in, and worth around 35% of our overall grade. Now, although most people were going for micro level services around particular issues, I'd planned to stick with my usual risk taking approach in attempting to design something of a macro scale to take on a broad range of social issues. However, due to the additional stresses around moving my friend, placing extreme limitations on my time, and the fact that I was trying to design something, a complete restructure of society, to the point I didn't even know where to begin to start or whether I was creating a philosophical framework or and how to articulate so many complex ideas within such a small word limit. I ended up bombing that assignment and receiving my first fail with the opportunity to resubmit with a maximum of 50%. Now I was devastated by this and approached the seal asking for some lenience on compassionate grounds due to my disabilities and the fact that I'd been caught up having to help my friend so that it would be worthwhile resubmitting the assignment because she was still someone that I really wanted to impress due to the fact that she had been the top of the list of all the people who I was hoping to approach for mentorship she was someone that I would have liked to have presented my best work to however she wouldn't budge in the slightest and in the end I don't believe I ended up resubmitting which meant that even though I'd got a high level credit and a distinction for my first two assignments, I ended up receiving a higher level pass for my overall grade for complexity in practice, which was very disappointing. 
Once my friend had arrived to Melbourne, he ended up experiencing some difficulties and I was put in a position where I was asked to lend him a couple of thousand dollars. Now, it wasn't something that I would have probably done for anyone else in my life, but due to the nature of the friendship, as one of my longest standing friends and with an incredibly good earning capacity to pay me back, and the fact that I'd be able to do so with still enough money left to get me through my placement and into my career, was also around this time, having been about 12 months since I'd seen my father, that I popped in to check how he was going. And he was surviving. And in addition to still battling the usual struggles, he'd tripped over a rose bush which had left a couple of scratches in his foot and his foot was swollen. About a week or so later, on the 10th of June, Dad gave me a call and asked for a lift to hospital. As he'd woken up that morning and his foot was still swollen and had become rather itchy, and when he went to scratch it, the skin basically melted and his fingers went straight through. What had happened was the rose had put spores in him, which had travelled up and created blockages or something in his leg. I can't remember the name of the condition. However, according to the doctors, it's actually quite a common condition with people who work with roses and can be very dangerous. Now this would require Dad having to spend around seven weeks in hospital, requiring seven sets of surgery and microsurgery, and there was a point in which they thought that they may have to amputate the foot. This created massive additional pressure that I didn't really need. I was in and out of the Royal Adelaide Hospital two or three times a week in between making sure Dad had clean clothing, taking him wheelchairs and other things that he needed. Throughout all of the stress of the first semester, the one thing I had been looking forward to that would provide a well-needed opportunity to rejuvenate before commencing my final student placement the following week was picking my children up from Wyala and taking them to see my nana and grandpa for a holiday on their farm in the Flinders Ranges. However, as usual, I drove to the other side of Port Augusta where I stopped to make a phone call and say I would be there within half an hour just to find out that there had been a miscommunication and the children had been sent away with their auntie. Now this completely devastated me. I remember calling Rosie absolutely distraught. I remember making reference to the fact that I was suicidal and that I would be driving to my grandparents because I didn't feel safe to be on the highway. Now there was something very out of place which Rosie said in response to that. I'm not worried about you now. I'm worried about you when you get back. Now, after I got off the phone, I remember thinking that just didn't make sense. It was so out of place. It was completely out of context and I couldn't see what she was referring to. Now, the significance of this quote is the fact that Rosie was well aware of how much stress I was under and the fact that I was on the verge of suicide well before the gaslighting and psychological abuse she inflicted upon me, which, looking back over what she put me through in the months following this, I can't help but wonder to myself, was Rosie trying to deliberately drive me to suicide? In addition to this, this also becomes relevant in around nine months time, when Rosie deliberately sabotages my next opportunity to see my children. Heading back into the city from Hawker, I stopped off and had a few drinks with my cousin before stopping in at the Old Spot Hotel to grab a carton of Cooper's Sparkling. I cracked my beer and got back on the road and then at the first set of lights, a hotted up Commodore pulled up beside me and started revving his engine. I was in my WRX and gave it a little bit of a squirt up to 80 before pulling back. And then this Commodore starts going womp womp womp. I'm thinking, fuck, you're a dickhead. He repeated this when I pulled up to the next set of lights. Then again at the third set of lights as I took a swig of my beer, I thought you couldn't be a cop. Sure enough, once he got up to 80, he pulls back and it turned out being a detective in a Hoon Bay car. Of course he made me do a breath analysis and I blew 0.04 before he made me step out of the car and started questioning whether I'd tampered with my license. Now, of course, 0.04 is well within the prescribed alcohol limit. However, although my license said it was current, the police system said I was expired, which would make a reading of 0.04 an offence. So I was required to go back to the station for further investigations. 
Once I got back to the station, I blew zeros twice on the breath analysis machine. And after Detective Dragon had gone and sought consultation with his superiors, I was advised that due to my reading and provided I was telling the truth about my license that I had not committed offence and he would escort me back to my car. On the way out of the station he asked me if I normally drag people up Main North Road. I responded by saying I was hardly dragging you. Although he kind of scoffed at that, I responded by saying, look mate, you and I both know what these cars can do. You know, I'm not denying that I'd give it a little bit of a squirt, but I was hardly dragging. And I think he could see my point and that I had quite a reasonable attitude towards it. Then once he got back into his car, he shook his head and said, I can't believe you blew zeros. I can still smell it all over your breath. And to be honest, I was quite surprised at the reading, given the fact that I drank a six pack of sparkling on my way from Hawker to Hillbank, then had a couple of scotches, after which I drank over half a stubby of sparkling between the old spot and being pulled over. When we got back to my car, I got out and shook his hand. I remember him saying, look, you're either the best liar and fraud I've ever met, in which case when we get you, you're fucked, or you're telling the truth and you're fine. However, remember that I've got your ID and our system says that you don't have a license, so be careful. Now, due to the uncertainty regarding my license, and the fact that having a license and a reliable vehicle was a requirement of my placement. The following day, when I was due to begin my placement, I had little choice but to go in and advise my supervisor that I would be unable to begin my student placement until I had resolved the issues with my license, which ended up creating a great deal of stress over the following week as I become like a ping pong ball between the police and the register of motor vehicles, both of which insisted the problem was on the other end. But I had some police saying that they would arrest me for driving without a license. At times I was followed by police who I imagine picked up that I didn't have a license and then didn't bother when I parked out the front of the police station, etc. Absolute massive stress. In the end, I couldn't get it resolved, and I believe that Detective Dragon, who had pulled me over, managed to sort it out, after which I was finally able to resume my placement. Now, whilst Dad was in hospital, a number of people had taken up residence and were squatting in his unit, which required my friend and I to go down and evict the squatters and change the locks. Now, I guess this was kind of a potentially dangerous situation. I had always been uncomfortable with the units within which Dad was living. They were very much like a public housing type ghetto environment, which attracted all kinds of street level drug addict type characters. And you'd often encounter groups of detectives patrolling the premises. However, well aware of what we were walking into, we took appropriate precautions. We also had the rights to the property. And in the end, as things turned out, the squatters left without too much of a fuss. Now, in providing more of an idea of the nature of the environment within which Dad was residing, that particular public housing complex would make the front page of the Sunday Mail on the 3rd of that December due to drugs, violence and gang-related activity. Yeah. Throughout the second half of July, I recall Rosie and I having a number of discussions relating to our incompatibility, which existed on many levels, not just the difference in our value systems. However, physical incompatibility, such as the fact that I was too physically large for her, and often when I'd climax, I would end up hurting her, which, which wasn't much fun for either of us. During these discussions, Rosie then made me promise not to hook up with anyone on the dance scene because she claimed she would be unable to handle this. Although I didn't see it as particularly realistic or practical given the fact that we were both dancers and social workers, I agreed to it on the basis that as time passed and with a level of sensitivity, it shouldn't be an issue for either of us. Now, such conversations are significant in several ways. Firstly, this enabled Rosie to maintain control of the situation as had I hooked up with someone else first, Rosie would have been unable to gaslight me and play me off as the obsessed ex. Secondly, such conversations would create a huge amount of confusion with the way I was played off 
And finally, this would also drastically increase the level of hurt I would experience in the many ways with which Rosie used various aspects of her new relationships as weapons against me. Now this, now this was about the same time that Rosie dyed her hair red and completely changed all aspects of her appearance, which I questioned and she claimed that she got advice from Julia that she has to present herself so that everyone will want to be like her. Which I questioned and said, well, you don't need to pretend to be things you're not. How about being yourself? Now, an interesting coincidence I see looking back at these changes is the fact that Rosie dyed her hair red and began styling it exactly the same as this dancer that she was completely obsessed with, who I recall Rosie mentioning had a psycho ex. Now, given the fact that I know that Rosie Bourne is the type of person who will pretend to be a virgin for 10 years to fit in, play the victim throughout her entire placement, so that she can pretend she's a social worker. Personally, I don't think it's too far-fetched for me to suggest that one of the many ways in which Rosie manipulated the whole situation to serve her interests is likely to have been in manufacturing something with which she could have in common with her hero in order to fit in. Now, it was around late June, early July, that I recall Rosie making reference to me in relation to a particular song, Jar of Hearts, which I didn't pay too much attention to due to the fact that I was driving and had a million other things on my plate. However, looking back at the lyrics of this incredibly bitter, vindictive song, I think it provides a number of clues as to Rosie's motives and intention to play me off the way that she did. Who do you think you are? running around leaving scars, collecting your jar of hearts, and tearing love apart. You're gonna catch a cold from the ice inside Rosie's soul. So don't come back for me. Who do you think you are? See, to Rosie, love was all about possession and control. And her delusional religious-based fantasies of a relationship that she conjured up with her buddies in their virgin club, none of whom had ever had a relationship. And according to Rosie's actions, when she doesn't get what she wants and feels rejected, that gives her the right to completely destroy someone's entire life. Whereas me, on the other hand, who's mature enough to recognize that just because two people may not be compatible for a traditional style relationship for any combination of many reasons, doesn't mean that relationship isn't loving. It was never about collecting a jar of hearts. Yes, I've had many beautiful relationships with many people, both sexual and non-sexual. Love has nothing to do with sex. You know, and just because those relationships couldn't be more than what they were, many of those people still hold special places in my heart. And in fact, after five years being trapped in a trauma cycle throughout the period of the worst of the abuse, it's only been in the last couple of years through various more recent forms of therapy that, that I've been able to cut through enough of the trauma to recall and see the significance of things like this. Now, although I'd put a great deal of effort into advocating on Dad's behalf, trying to ensure that appropriate arrangements would be made for his rehabilitation. Dad was discharged to his own premises with the instructions that he was to lay for three hours with his leg raised and he was only allowed up for 15 minutes out of every three hours with no weight on the foot. Dad had no transport. The closest shopping center was about a kilometer away uphill and absolutely no way of looking after himself. Now, absolutely everyone, Rosie, my mum, my closest friend, told me not to look after Dad. However, I knew that there was no way he could look after himself. And I felt that it was the least that I owed him due to everything he had done throughout my life. And I also saw the fact that the six weeks he had spent hospitalised had got him off of all substances which had been causing him problems, making it the perfect opportunity where I may be able to help him without just throwing resources to the wind. 
Of course, as I had my unit set up specifically to cater for my studies, I had absolutely nowhere to put my father, which required me to have my student placement postponed for yet another week in order to completely rearrange and set up my unit in order to cater for someone who was unable to walk. And whilst doing so, and over the following months, I'd exhaust a great deal of energy trying to advocate on his behalf, attempting to access all kinds of services for both my father and myself as a carer, most of which, in the end, either him or myself would be ineligible for. And in the few cases where we did meet the eligibility criteria, we were unable to jump through the hoops in order to access the services. The most significant support with which I received come from the university who were able to provide extensions on work that I had due, as well as recommending services which, as I've stated in the end, we were ineligible for. Now, it was roughly mid-August, the night that Rosie and I broke up, not that we were ever technically in a relationship. She'd planned to come over and see me as usual after teaching. However, she ended up running late and would call a couple of hours later to inform me that dance partner Sam had overheard a conversation with her sister where her sister had mentioned her crush on him and proceeds to inform me that now she's trading me for her dance partner. Within just a matter of weeks to making me commit to not hooking up with anyone on the dance scene. To be honest, I was shocked and, and quite offended really with her choice of looks. However, Rosie assured me, I still love you, we're still friends, nothing's changed but the sex. When we caught up about a week later at her place, as soon as I walked in the door, her response was, oh, you've got a really huge cock, you know. Now this was absolutely the last thing I needed to hear, given the fact that I'd been dumped for the ugly guy with the huge nose. As far as I was concerned, I was the last person in the world who needed to know about his tiny cock. Throughout September, as my life fell deeper and deeper into crisis, Rosie continued to up the level of her gaslighting and games. There would be constant waiting games with many changes in plans in between the times when we would catch up. She started behaving really strange in public before setting me up to be gaslighted by Samuel Nicholas, who I'd never met before. The first time I saw Samuel, I was having actually quite an awkward dance with Rosie and he gave me this really bizarre look. It was quite eerie, it made me very uncomfortable. That night she'd come up with this stupid idea that she was going to have three weeks off of teaching, which I argued against because I thought it was making an unnecessary scene. I was arguing with both dancers and both social workers we were gonna be crossing paths. I need you to just treat me normal in public, I'd be sensitive, treat me normal in public, I don't wanna hear about his little cock. To which I was getting responses like, you've got to prove to me you can treat me normal in public by pretending I'm not there. For coming up with this silly idea that she was going to have three weeks off teaching, which I argued against because I thought it was making an unnecessary public display. Although I recall Rosie and I having a number of discussions on the downstairs Glen Osmond Road veranda of the Arkaba Hotel throughout this period, I believe it was this occasion that included the following examples of her projection, which I'm now able to see as holding great significance. As I argued with Rosie over the lunacy of her ridiculous expectations, and in between her throwing in positive reinforcement claiming that she still loved me, Rosie proceeded to throw in these incredibly confusing one-liners that were completely out of context with the rest of the conversation and often when she'd do so, she'd go about this in an over-dramatised manner. The first example was when I was arguing against her unrealistic expectation for me to prove that I could treat her normal in public by pretending she's not there. She suddenly cut me off with, Stop abusing me! From what I recall, there was no one nearby on the veranda at the time However, during this conversation we were standing by the tables adjacent to an open doorway. And looking back, it is not only possible, but likely that Rosie threw in such comments at times when there were people that I was unaware of standing within earshot just inside the door. Another example which also has strong links to her malicious intent is that when I was arguing with her that we were both dancers and social workers and that I needed her to treat me normal in public, Rosie then threw in, but we won't be seeing each other anymore. 
which to me made absolutely no sense at all. After 10 minutes or so of banging my head against a brick wall, challenging her ridiculous expectations, Rosie then cut the conversation short, once again in an out of context and over dramatized manner with, I'm just a scared little girl, before racing off through the open doorway and disappearing into the crowd. Of course, this all left me incredibly confused and questioning everything that I knew that Rosie should know about me. I'd always treated her extremely well through the couple of years we'd known one another. She, she was aware of enough of my relationships with my children and others, as well as my value systems in relation to a broad range of social issues, which we had discussed throughout our studies into social work, and a broad range of other aspects of my life. Although I feel like a fool and it's kind of embarrassing to admit, although over the first couple of years or so that I had known Rosie, I'd been in a far stronger position to challenge the majority of the unhealthy and unrealistic expectations that she imposed upon me. Between becoming desensitized to her madness, as well as burnt out by the circumstances that I was facing, I began submitting to Rosie. And really, for the first time in my life, beginning to act in a people-pleasing style manner, trying to live up to her expectations, as my crisis escalated in a desperate bid for mercy. And as the story goes on, every time that I questioned instances of such behaviour, Rosie Eva found some way of diverting from the question and or throwing or projecting it back on me in ways in which would throw the scent off what she was actually doing and leave me questioning myself. Now in hindsight, with what would happen over the following weeks, I have absolutely no doubt that Rosie told very few people about her planned intention to have these three weeks off of dance. When I got home, I received a friend request from Samuel, which I didn't accept for around 24 hours due to the uncomfortability I experienced with the look that he'd given me. However, after about 24 hours, I thought, what the hell, what harm can it do? And I accepted the request. First status I see is, I love watching sexual tension between two people. His next status was, I love going through people's profiles to see who their friends are. And I was thinking, surely this prick's not for real. Followed by a number of really weird statuses, which of course I would come across completely crazy if I was to suggest they were aimed at me. However, the following Wednesday night at the Arkaba, when which was the first night that Rosie was not meant to be there, I was leaning up against the, I don't know, counter-like thing around the seating area in the northeast corner, just by the Glen Osmond Road entrance. Just leaning there, minding my own business, watching other dancers, waiting for the song to change so I could find a partner and have a dance. Then next minute, who walks in? Rosie and Samuel. And proceed dancing right next to me, almost on top of me. Of course, this made me very uncomfortable, particularly given her stupid games where I was supposed to prove I could treat her normal in public by pretending she's not there. I wasn't even allowed to look at her. Throughout the duration of the song, I hear Rosie say three times, Stop being mean. Don't be mean. Stop being mean. You know, I'm thinking, you can't be serious. I can't even look at the prick if he's pulling faces at me or poking his tongue out. I've got no idea how I'm going to react. Then the song finished, I don't know where they went. It threw me so much, I didn't even ask someone to dance. Rather just leant there with my arms crossed trying to process it. Next minute, of course, Samuel walks up, puts his hand out and goes, how you going? Of course, I had very little option without making myself look like a prick other than to just shake his hand. So I put my hand out and go, yeah, all right, yourself. To which he grabs my hand, pokes his face in almost nose to nose and does a semicircle taunt around me going, really, really relax. Now, although I've never hit anyone out of anger, at least in my adult life and, and possibly even throughout my teens, in the state that I was in, I did extremely well not to just drop Samuel. Although my hands were very much tight, given the fact that I'd just invested four years of my life undertaking a university degree, and just one assault charge would completely destroy my career prospects as a social worker. And I sure as hell wasn't about to throw my career away for that little prick. 
Now, another possible and highly likely motive for this instance of taunting, as well as the torment and abuse that I would experience over the following months, which is very consistent with the ways in which Hugo goes about playing people off against one another in his running of Latino groups, is the fact that if I'd hit Samuel or any of the other abusers, Hugo would have had an excuse to ban me from his events. Now, although Samuel was not an employee of Latino Grusa at the time of this, from what I've come to know of him, he's an incredibly weedy, spineless snake who I very much doubt would have had the guts to taunt anyone in such a manner without reassurances from someone like Hugo. And it wouldn't be long after this that Samuel would become a member of Latino Grusa staff. Now, on top of many other taunts over the years, Samuel has admitted to this particular instance of taunting as a member of Latino Groove's staff at Latino Groove's events, as a cruel means of rubbing salt in old wounds, and attempting to further taunt reactions out of me, which, after years of perseverance, refusing to allow them to drive me away from something that I love, was among the final instances of bullying that I experienced at Casa Blah Blah that led me to stop attending Latino Groove's events. Due to the severe impact it was having on me recovering from the trauma I experienced at Latino Groove. Now, back to the night of Samuel's original taunts in September 2011, Although I was stirred up in ways that I can't even begin to describe and confused to the fact that she was even there in the first place. When she come and grabbed her bag which she had put down beside me, I actually thanked her due to the fact she had said at least three times for him to stop being mean. And although I was unable to bring myself to have looked as to what she may have been referring to, I was too confused and naive to consider that this was something that she'd set up. And when I thanked her, she seemed confused. And what made things even more confusing for me after that was the fact that when we made eye contact from across the room, several minutes later as she left, Rosie was putting on what I now know was an incredibly deliberate, over-dramatized, scared look. Now looking back at this, I can see very clearly that aside from Samuel, Hugo and Julia, and perhaps a few others, I have absolutely no doubt that Rosie had told virtually no one that she had actually made plans not to be there that night, and very deliberately arranged Samuel to taunt the absolute fuck out of me and leave me boiling so then she could put on an act and look scared as she walked out the door. Then after proceeding to make such a scene, she then used this as an excuse to take the next couple of weeks off of dance. Now, although I should have immediately removed Samuel from social media at that point in time, I couldn't bring myself to and wanted to know who the hell this little prick was. And although I did incredibly well under the circumstances in not breaking Rosie's ridiculous little non-contact, at least for the next week or so, there were a number of occasions throughout that period that I didn't respond well at all with drunken Facebook statuses, often provoked. I know at some point Samuel changed his profile picture to a photo of him with this giant schnitzel hanging out his mouth that that looked identical to the ones Rosie and I always ate at the Earl of Leicester, which stirred me up. Rosie put some crap up in another language, which when translated was quite provocative. And then I started putting garbage up in different languages and, and no doubt making myself look completely insane, as well as posting some rather aggressive statuses that were indirectly aimed at Samuel trying to back the prick off. About nine days later on the Saturday night at the event at the Gov, I broke the non-contact and confronted Rosie trying to find out who the hell Samuel was and let her know what he'd actually done to me. When I went to describe his taunt, Rosie wouldn't even hear me out, covered her face, don't want to know, and turned around and said, oh, Samuel's a really nice guy. Then when I questioned whether she may have said something in relation to me around Samuel, or even to someone else within earshot of Samuel that may have put the idea into his head that it was a good idea to stir me up. She turned around and projected it back on me. You're reading into things. Now, I confronted Samuel and asked why he was trying to stir me up, to which he threw off me, oh, why would I want to create trouble in this wonderful environment? In a very smug, smart-ass manner to stir me up before racing off, 
Now I can't probably remember the majority of what was said, everything I questioned was thrown back and I know I was left feeling quite stirred up by the little prick. I remember trying to speak to Rosie at some other point that night and then being grabbed by Julia quite aggressively telling me I've got to leave her alone. A few weeks later when Rosie would meet up with me, she would tell me that she had to hide in the green room. It's absolute bullshit. She had to give my belongings back. If you're going to say you're not going to be somewhere and then rock up with someone that I don't even know, stir the absolute fuck out of me, you don't have to hide in the green room. She didn't have to hide in the green room. She was pretending to hide in the green room. Putting on a show for the entire dance scene. Cutting in there, there are already many clear examples of the ways in which Rosie Bourne, in her position, was very successfully able to use triangulation to manipulate both myself and the audience in creating the illusion of the obsessed ex. As described in my previous feeds, by taking me along with months of games Refusing to treat me normal in public within the dance community, yet continuing to meet up with me privately, she was able to create the illusion or false boundaries and set me up in ways which would appear as if I was breaking those boundaries. Now, a good example of this is when I was arguing to just be treated normal in public and was given the response, you have to prove to me you can treat me normal in public by pretending I'm not there. Right at the time where she decided to very publicly take three weeks of teaching at the Arkaba, which I argued against because I thought it was making an unnecessary public display. Just to break that boundary herself by rocking up with Samuel Nicholas and then stirring me up. Of course, the way in which I reacted to Samuel stirring me up, which resulted in me breaking that boundary to find out who the hell he was, and the show that Rosie put on as a result of that, I have very little doubt that from an external perspective to anyone else within the dance community, this would have very much appeared as if I was the obsessed ex. Now, I have no idea what information Rosie was presenting to the rest of the audience. I highly doubt that she was telling people that she was meeting up with me privately and that she'd set me up with silly games when I questioned who Samuel Nicholas was and his behaviour and whether she may have disclosed any information around him that may have led to his behaviour, I was told you're reading into things, projecting it back on me. Another example is the fact that she changed her phone number well before she'd given my belongings back. And I actually believe it was before the last time I'd actually gone down on it. Of course, everyone within the dance community would have been questioning why she'd taken the time off teaching. Why did she change her phone number? Once again, I have no idea what she was telling others. I doubt she was telling anyone else that she was making me beg for my belongings back. Of course, by doing these things, she was very successfully able to create a divide and isolate me from a large portion of the dance community. Of course, people's misinterpretation of the many ways in which I failed to cope with Rosie Bourne's torment and abuse all filtered back up through the dance community to boost Rosie's little ego and sense of self-importance whilst completely destroying my reputation. Now another thing that I found incredibly confusing was that within weeks or perhaps a couple of months of making me promise not to hook up with anyone on the dance scene because she couldn't handle it and whilst Rosie proceeded to gaslight me and make me beg for my belongings back, all of a sudden Rosie was to be appearing on a national TV show, which I believe was called something along the lines of Marry My Son. Now, aside from the fact that she made me promise not to hook up with anyone else, another significant thing about her appearing on this television show 
is the fact that Rosie would have had to have begun the application process for this TV show well before she had traded me for Sam. Now another extremely interesting and significant coincidence is the fact that over the couple of years that I'd been seeing Rosie, Latino Group staff policy forbid their employees from attending other dance schools, social events or classes. Which is a policy that many people within the dance community are likely to be familiar with and is something that over those years I actually questioned the legality of. However, coincidentally, at exactly the same time that Hugo Solcedo claims that I allegedly become obsessed with Rosie, the Tango staff members began frequenting other dance schools' social events where they proceeded to torment me. Over those couple of months, I recall a number of Latino Group staff frequently attending Salsa Connection's social event at the Tapas Bar on Hindley Street. On one occasion, I recall Rosie Bourne, Sam Staker and a couple of others sitting out the front with at least half a dozen people as I was having a cigarette, deliberately tormenting me going, Sam, 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 in very provocative manners. I actually believe it was on this particular occasion that I recall Hugo Solcedo standing at the bar on, at Tapas with his arms crossed and looking me up and down in an extremely intimidating fashion. Now, although most of Latino Groove staff were involved in the bullying over these months, I feel I should point out that Juan Carlos, or Happy Feet, never participated in any of the abuse. I don't actually recall him ever being at the tapas bar. I do recall him being somewhat unsure of me at times. However, I also recall the look of pain and empathy in his eye. I believe that he was very well aware of what Latino Grooves were doing and found himself in quite a powerless position as he did not approve of their treatment towards me. Now Happy Feet actually began teaching for Latino Grooves whilst I was seeing Rosie and initially was quite wary of me. However, as he sussed me out from a distance over time, I believe he was able to identify that whatever he was being told didn't fit in with what he could see of my nature. The few interactions that I've had with Happy Feet over the years, he has been very pleasant and treated me well. However, I have never been able to raise the question surrounding the abuse that I experienced at Latino Grooves. I do also recall, and coincidentally, as soon as Happy Feet's contract run out with Latino Grooves, he was seen everywhere within the dance community other than anywhere near Latino Grooves. I also find it a huge coincidence that now that I'm finally standing up to the bullying I experienced at Latino Grooves, that Latino Grooves have got Happy Feet back under contract. Now, although this could well be a coincidence, like I've said, I have never discussed this with Happy Feet. I find it very difficult to believe that Happy Feet could have remained completely unaware of the abuse that I experienced. Due to the level of involvement from other staff members at Latino Grooves, and from what I know from throughout the years that I spent with Rosie about the gossipy nature of Latino Grooves, I... And of course I was naively discussing all of the problems that I was facing with insofar as trying to look after my father on top of my university placement, etc. On the 28th of August, I'd just bought a burger and had decided to drive into the city to see a friend. However, as I hadn't called ahead, once I'd parked on Carrington Street, I gave him a call. However, as it turned out, my friend just happened to be sick. And as I was on the phone eating my burger, all of a sudden this car pulls up, pulls out this Wacken Great camera and starts taking photos of me. Immediately, I told my friend I had to go, hung up the phone, then proceeded to do a U-turn and follow him up Carrington Street, then on to Pulteney. It was quite heavy traffic and as we approached Glen Osmond Road, he suddenly pulled left and as I wasn't able to get behind him, I pulled up next to him and wound the window down, after which he accused me of being a cop, which was one of the possible things I thought he might be. We started arguing from the cars and then he let me ahead of him to pull over. 
We pulled over by the parklands about halfway to KFC and proceeded to spend the next 10 or 15 minutes arguing over who was the cop. Now, the whole situation and his story didn't make sense, which was basically that he thought I was a cop who had been harassing him before questioning why I was parked near a police station, to which I pointed out had about 200 units next to it. Now, I was extremely uncomfortable with this and due to the fact that I'd been dealing with all of that shit, I'd had police accusing me of cr being a criminal, then next minute I've got someone running around with photos accusing me of being a cop, to say the least, I was not impressed. However, his story just didn't make sense. It was too basic and just kept reverting back to me being a cop and him being harassed. He was driving a vehicle that wouldn't have been worth any more than $500. However, he's a However the camera with which he used to photograph me, I'd expect would be well over $1,000. His appearance was about what you'd expect of a detective in some kind of dodgy evening soapy like Home and Away. Like an incredibly poor attempt to try and look scruffy with a three day growth and flannelette druggy shirt, yet a $60 haircut. It didn't matter what angle with which I argued with him, he always come back to this simple basic argument that I was a cop harassing him. It wasn't long before I was satisfied that there's no way in hell he was a detective due to the simple fact that he just wasn't good enough. With the lack of substance, he wouldn't be alive. After about 10 or 15 minutes, I jumped in the car and left. I was, I was silly and didn't take his rego. However, the whole situation scared the absolute hell out of me to the point that I shut down my phone, was too scared to go home, and ended up going to Rosie's and begging to stay the night where no one could find me. The following day at my placement, after speaking to some of my colleagues, I learned that Centrelink had been undertaking investigations on disability pensioners, which made me think back to 20 years earlier when they were putting logs across people's driveways who were on work cover and then taking photographs of them attempting to move the logs. Although this would seem a more likely possibility due to the way in which this man carried himself, I'd like to think that it would be considered highly unethical and outright dangerous for them to run around following and taking photos of people with disabilities for mental illness that include conditions such as anxiety disorders and then turn around and accuse them of being cops. Having said this, it's not altogether impossible. With our government's approach to ethics on many issues, there is also the possibility that Rosie set this up, given the others that would soon become involved in her gaslighting. However, it's also possible that this was just a coincidence, and the chances are that I will never know who this man is. However, the most important point relating to this incident is that it was one of many factors contributing to the highly stressful circumstances with which I was facing that, that Rosie was very well aware of. On the 15th of September, I got lobbed with a license disqualification several years late due to supposedly exceeding my demerit points and being caught up in the government bungle that resulted in tens of thousands of people receiving late disqualifications. Now normally I would have gone with the three month disqualification, however, due to my license being a requirement of my student placement, I was forced to take the good behaviour option of one point for a year which of course created additional anxiety. Now I think it would be useful to take a look at triangulation which is a relatively new concept to myself and is a form of control and manipulation often used by narcissists particularly in forms of abuse such as gaslighting. In introducing this concept, I think it's best to start off by looking at a brief definition of triangulation throughout which I'll possibly cut in from time to time and look at some of the many clear examples of how triangulation was used throughout my experience with gaslighting at Latino Groves. According to Wikipedia's definition of triangulation in psychology, Triangulation is a manipulation tactic where one person will not communicate directly with another person, instead using a third person to relay communication to the second, thus forming a triangle. 
It also refers to a form of splitting in which one person manipulates relationship between two parties by controlling communication between them. Triangulation may manifest itself as a manipulative device to engineer rivalry between two people, known as divide and conquer, or playing one person against another. If we skip child development straight to narcissism, in the context of narcissism, triangulation is when the narcissist attempts to control the flow, interpretation and nuances of communication between two separate actors or groups of actors, ensuring communications flow through and consistently relate back to the narcissist provides a feeling of importance. Common scenarios include a parent attempting to control communication between two children, or an emotionally abusive partner attempting to control communication between the other partner and the other partner's friends and family. A narcissistic person wants to ensure the other actors communicate through them, but remains otherwise isolated. In some cases, narcissists will use control of communication to drive a wedge between the other parties. This can be done by falsely making one of the actors or groups of actors into a scapegoat for problems that the narcissist is actually responsible for or that are otherwise unrelated. In addition, the narcissist may falsely credit the other actor with saying or thinking something hurtful or may put too much emphasis on an aspect of something that was said to them that ignores the wider context. Cutting in there, there are already many clear examples of the ways in which Rosie Bourne in her position was very successfully able to use triangulation to manipulate both myself and the audience in creating the illusion of the obsessed ex as described in my previous feeds by tagging me along with months of games refusing to treat me normal in public within the dance community yet continuing to meet up with me privately she was able to create the illusion or false boundaries and set me up in ways which would appear as if I was breaking those boundaries. Now a good example of this is when I was arguing to just be treated normal in public and was given the response, you have to prove to me you can treat me normal in public by pretending I'm not there. Right at the time where she decided to very publicly take three weeks of teaching at the Arkaba, which I argued against because I thought it was making an unnecessary public display. Just to break that boundary herself by rocking up with Samuel Nicholas and then stirring me up of course, the way in which I reacted to Samuel stirring me up, which resulted in me breaking that boundary to find out who the hell he was, and the show that Rosie put on as a result of that, I have very little doubt that from an external perspective to anyone else within the dance community, this would have very much appeared as if I was the obsessed ex. Now, I have no idea what information Rosie was presenting to the rest of the audience. I highly doubt that she was telling people that she was meeting up with me privately and that she'd set me up with silly games when I questioned who Samuel Nicholas was and his behaviour and whether she may have disclosed any information around him that may have led to his behaviour, I was told you're reading into things, projecting it back on me. Another example is the fact that she changed her phone number well before she'd given my belongings back and I actually believe it was before the last time I'd actually gone down on it. Of course, everyone within the dance community would have been questioning why she'd taken the time off teaching. Why did she change her phone number? Once again, I have no idea what she was telling others. I doubt she was telling anyone else that she was making me beg for my belongings back. Of course, by doing these things, she was very successfully able to create a divide and isolate me from a large portion of the dance community 
of course, people's misinterpretation of the many ways in which I failed to cope with Rosie Bourne's torment and abuse, all filtered back up through the dance community to boost Rosie's little ego and sense of self-importance, whilst completely destroying my reputation. Alternatively, the narcissist may attempt to use triangulation to put a third actor between them and someone with whom they are commonly in conflict. Rather than communicating directly with the actor with whom they are in conflict, the narcissist will send communication supporting his or her case through a third actor in an attempt to make the communication more credible. Reserving comments on those final sentences for the time being, these third actors that they mention raise another concept that I am only newly becoming familiar, which is flying monkeys. However, before we take a look at what a flying monkey is and does and the various roles they play within triangulation, whilst we're still on the subject of shapes, I think it's worth taking a quick look at geometric physics. Now, a triangle is a relatively strong shape, particularly in its three-dimensional form, perhaps as a three-sided pyramid. You know, it has a great deal of integrity. However, this is relative and very much dependent upon the position it's in and from which angles it's stressed. However, a stronger shape than a triangle is arguably a circle which has far greater versatility in its integrity, whether in its two-dimensional form as a circle or in its three-dimensional form as a sphere, as demonstrated by objects such as hula hoops or balls, which have great ability to retain or regain their form, regardless whether pressure or force is internally or externally applied as opposed to triangles or pyramids, which although holding a great deal of integrity under the right circumstances, become vulnerable to either breaking or distorting should pressure or force be applied from the wrong directions. For example, if you were to attempt to roll or throw a pyramid against a wall. Now, without professing to understand the complexities of, let's say, the refraction of light through a transparent sphere or triangle, and acknowledging potential flaws in this example, metaphorically speaking, it may be useful to consider objects such as a prism, and the ways in which prisms may be used to hone in and magnify on particular issues whilst losing focus on the broader context. Or, to the contrary, zoom out to the point they completely lose focus of any meaningful detail. In contrast, if we look at another object which to many may seem alternate or superstitious, such as a crystal ball, which at least in folklore may be used to examine a situation in its full context unencumbered by the parameters of space and time. The relevance of such discussion is the fact that in order to counter triangulation, by raising my complaints publicly, I'm basically provoking the equivalent of a 360 audit. Basically, my understanding of a 360 audit is it's a format of audit within organisations where every member within that organisation is required to examine and report upon the performance and conduct of every other member within the organisation. Thus, creating a 360 perspective of each member within the organisation. Now, I like to think that it was very obvious that I raised my complaints in full face of the public due to the complexities and severe degree by which my trust has been violated. By doing so, I basically left Latino groups with two options. They could either have some integrity and stand with me and own their part in this situation or stand against me. Of course, rather than showing integrity, Latino Grooves' response to my complaints was a blatant attempt at mass triangulation through Hugo's disgraceful post, playing the victim, claiming that it's all lies that I made up to hurt them, which makes absolutely no sense, whilst in the same breath lying himself and adding three years to the story to in a 
in a blatant attempt to make it seem as if it's older than what it is, claiming that I'm crazy and an obsessed ex, initially tagging me in that post before blocking me out of the conversation after only allowing me the opportunity to respond to two comments, in a blatant attempt to manipulate the narrative and encourage the flow of gossip to flow freely through to them, whilst more readily enabling them and their flying monkeys to manipulate people one on one with whatever combination of outright lies or out of context pieces of information they use to, to build their case in turning people against me and creating new flying monkeys. And of course up until Hugo's attempt at mass triangulation, none of this has ever came back to me to ever allow me any opportunity to stand up for myself against their lies and out of context information. Now although all I ever wanted was my name cleared and peace on the dance scene, and despite the fact I was overly diplomatic in leaving the gates wide open for Latino groups to show some integrity, I honestly didn't expect them to do so. However, despite doing my best to remain realistic with such expectations, I can't deny that as time passed after the fact, I found myself just disappointed in ways in their response. However, this response has been invaluable in several ways. Firstly, by responding to my complaints of gaslighting and being played off publicly by playing me off publicly in an attempt at mass triangulation, all they have done is demonstrated their lack of integrity and narcissistic mentalities. Secondly, it has also provided the first real and very clear confirmation of exactly what the gossip and rumours that they have been spreading about me, which has given me something that I can stand up to and fight against, due to the fact that they so successfully triangulated that absolutely nothing has come back to me up until this point in time. Now what Hugo has done within that post is actually a lot of things. It's a crime against my sexuality. Of course, I'm crazy to suggest a few religious people who obviously don't approve of the fact that I don't believe in monogamy might be so narcissistic as to destroy all aspects of my life and play me off as a psycho ex, which to be honest, anyone with half a clue should be able to see their story just doesn't make sense. It's also a major crime against me socially, which has affected all aspects of my life. It's also extremely cruel and dangerous attempts to further isolate and ostracize me. Extremely narcissistic behavior. Now, I wish that I'd read the following article eight or nine years ago that I believe does a very good job of unpacking what flying monkeys are, the roles that they play, and the many clear examples of this throughout my experience with gaslighting, as well as the many ways in which I was drawn in and played like an absolute fiddle. At this stage, I'm not entirely sure who to correctly credit this article to. However, I accessed it via the Medium website and it was one of the first hits that come up when I googled flying monkeys. I have however left a comment stating my intention of possibly using the article to unpack my experience with gaslighting so hopefully I will have heard back from the author before I present the following. Flying monkeys, the narcissist tool for the smear campaign. The topic today is about the role of flying monkeys, who can become flying monkeys, how the narcissist recruits flying monkeys against the target, why does the narcissist use these flying monkeys, and then I am going to give you a mini survival guide for dealing with flying monkeys. The narcissist spins a web of false reality and casts this out amongst a group of people. The flying monkeys subscribe to that reality. Flying monkeys will then betray you by revealing something private about you, or maybe they'll tell people a total lie about you. 
They will pass on this gossip or rumour pretending that they're concerned about you and or telling people that you're abusive or crazy as per the narcissist's stories. First of all, flying monkeys are also known as the entourage, accomplices, enablers, extensions of the narcissist, campaign managers. They're out there recruiting other people, kind of in a way like religious people might knock on your door and try to recruit you into their religion. They're trying to convert you into the religion of the narcissist, which is reality by the narcissist. So the role of these flying monkeys is first of all abuse by proxy. Abuse by proxy is when the narcissist gets other people to abuse you. That way the narcissist gets to abuse you but through these people. They'll reject you, they'll make you feel not good enough, they'll shame you, maybe they'll put you in a bad situation, they'll tell you that you're crazy, things like that. This way the narcissist looks like the one that's clean, they're not involved. The flying monkeys are also used to spread rumours and gossip. This is one of their most prevalent roles, they are addicted to gossip. Usually these people go around and spread rumours and gossip that they heard. Flying monkeys do the narcissist's bidding. That's what the smear campaign is, is that they'll do whatever the narcissist wants. The narcissist wants them to go out and talk badly about you and spread lies about you or the narcissist wants them to outright abuse you or make you feel like you don't belong. Or maybe they invite you to a place where they know something horrible is going to happen for you and you're not going to be comfortable there. Those sort of things. Flying monkeys make the narcissist feel like they're important and special. They help the narcissist feel like they're grandiose, like they have high status, like they're famous or a celebrity. Which is what the narcissist wants to feel. Narcissists often have a whole entourage around them, just like a celebrity needs an entourage in order to feel secure about themselves. So who can become flying monkeys? There are two different categories of people. The first category is the naive. The naive are people who are just clueless. They can't see it. They can't fathom it. They've never been through anything like that. So they can't even imagine that somebody would do such a thing just to make up all these lies about you and spread them across town. They can't even fathom that a human would do that. Or maybe the naive is also the fawning type. This type of people who when faced with a fight or flight dilemma, they choose fawning instead where they just melt into a strong dominant personality to feel safe and they don't realise what's happening. You might have noticed that you even become one of these flying monkeys when you were in a naive state before you woke up, before you figured out what was going on. The second category of people who can become flying monkeys are the toxic. These are people with no boundaries. They love gossip and drama. They're addicted to that stuff. They have an integrity problem and usually they want something from the narcissist. They want status. They want flattery. They want favours. They're getting something out of the narcissist, which is why they're willing to do their bidding. How does the narcissist recruit flying monkeys against the target? Typically, what they'll do is they'll go around town or your community or however you know this person, maybe even your office, maybe it's a romance in an office, or maybe it's a boss or co-worker. They'll go around and tell everyone that you're the abusive one or that you're crazy. They'll usually, they're usually going to play one of these two things. Essentially, they're going to project and say that you're the abusive one, meaning you are doing all the things that they were doing to abuse you. Maybe they even call your family members and try to convert your family members into their reality. Or maybe this is even happening within your family. Abusers love to call you crazy when you figure out what's going on because they have to discredit you. If they don't go around telling people that you're crazy, they might believe you. When the narcissist tells you that you're crazy, that should set off an alarm bell for you to recognise it's a smear campaign. That that's a clue and that the narcissist is going to do a smear campaign. They're also going to play the role that they're just concerned about you. Women narcissists do this more often than men. They're concerned about your health and reveal information that was none of anyone's business. Something that you didn't want out there. This happened to one of my clients. His wife started telling her family and their friends, their mutual friends, that he was drinking a lot and he wasn't. She started telling him that he had some kind of alcohol problem and he overheard this conversation. They'll spread these kind of rumours about you. Or maybe they'll find out that you went on an antidepressant. 
So then they'll run their mouth and tell people how they're just so concerned about you because you're so depressed. It's an incredible betrayal when they reveal something that really happened to you or it's a total lie and they're making up something just to pretend that they're concerned about you and your health. Essentially, the narcissist spins this web of false reality and casts it out amongst this group of people. Then people subscribe to that reality. It's like they become engulfed into that web of false reality that they think is very real because the narcissist appears so convincing with an enormous amount of energy and emotion about the topic. It really seems like it could be true to a certain point, especially to people who just don't know. But the people who are subscribing and fully knowing the toxic, who are partaking in this because they are getting something out of it, they will gladly subscribe to this reality even if they know that it's a false reality. Why does the narcissist use flying monkeys? First of all, first of all they like to discredit the witness. They like to discredit you so that you don't reveal your truth or so that maybe you'll just be so ashamed and terrified that you won't say anything. Instead, you'll just swallow it. Maybe they know that you have the balls to tell the truth and to tell people in your community, your family, your circle of friends, your office, and they don't want you to reveal that truth. So they have to discredit you so that people aren't really sure who's telling the truth. Maybe it looks like you are totally the one who's lying in this situation when that's the exact opposite reality. Sometimes the narcissist will come up with flying monkeys even if you didn't even have a relationship with this person. Maybe you just innocently walked into a new job and this person just started targeting you. Maybe they instantly had a jealous competition over your talents, your abilities, your position, your alliances or something like that. Or maybe it's because someone likes you who doesn't like them and they want a favour for that person. Any kind of jealous competition can stoke up this kind of situation where narcissists will grab some flying monkeys or create flying monkeys in order to go against you. Now this is a very interesting point which up until now I've somehow failed to consider. Can anyone see any reason why Rosie might have to be jealous? On one hand you've got Rosie who has absolutely no experience with anything in life aside from pretending to be things she's not. Then on the other hand, you've got me, who has a wealth of experience in overcoming significant adversity, which has provided great insight into understanding myself and the world around me, as well as being far more intelligent and having a far greater sense of morality and integrity, Ah, despite from growing up in far lower socio-economic demographics, my parents actually loved me. Then there's the fact of Rosie's neglectful and highly religious upbringing which has her so indoctrinated into patriarchy that she believes when she can't control someone that gives her the right to completely destroy them. As opposed to me on the other hand who identifies with bra burning feminists and is openly critical about my views on the institutions such as marriage and monogamy and the roles that they play in patriarchal society who remains on amicable terms with most women I've been with who have been very upfront and honest in respectfully refusing to submit to Rosie's delusional religious ideas of a relationship throughout the time in which we had known one another. So if Rosie couldn't have me, there's no way in hell her narcissistic little ego could handle seeing me with anyone else on the dance scene, let alone continuing with the great success I was having in pursuit of my career, let alone to be seen socially as to have been rejected by me, despite the fact that we'd had many conversations about her incompatibility leading up to this. So, whilst gaslighting me and playing me off as the obsessed ex whilst inflicting such severe psychological abuse upon me that I would end up completely traumatised, Rosie was not only able to completely destroy all aspects of my life, but continue with her consistent pattern throughout life of playing the victim whilst pretending she's got some experience relevant to her career when in fact she's nothing more than just an incredibly dishonest and manipulative narcissistic perpetrator of domestic violence. Maybe the person likes you and doesn't like the narcissist. Or maybe they do like the narcissist and now the narcissist wants to triangulate and to make sure that the person likes the narcissist better than they like you. For whatever reason, they can't let you have that kind of friendship or alliance with that person. 
The narcissist doesn't have to get their hands dirty abusing you because they can recruit all these other people to do that work for themselves. And finally, they're going to use mobbing against you so that you feel alone and unsure of your reality. When it's one person against one person, that gaslighting can be really challenging. When it's a whole group of people who are subscribing to that reality and then you, you're going to feel really alone. You're going to feel really tempted to doubt yourself and your perception of reality. The flying monkeys can be a very powerful ally for the narcissist. Here's my quick survival guide for dealing with flying monkeys. First of all, stay in integrity. Commit to 100% integrity so they have nothing to use against you. And part of that is responding instead of reacting. Check out the three videos I did on this topic. Stay in integrity because if you freak out, if you do something wrong, if you abuse the narcissist back or you scream and look like you're crazy, then they have something to use against you. Especially if you do this in front of a group of people. Narcissists love to do that. They love to provoke you in front of a whole group of people. At a work meeting, at a family dinner, you and your partner going out with mutual friends or something like that. That's the worst part, is they'll get you to react and look like you're the crazy one, and they'll use that against you. Staying in integrity avoids that scenario. The second is to opt out. Opt out of this game. So what does this mean? That means going no contact when possible. Most definitely go no contact with the narcissist and also go no contact with their flying monkeys. You want to block them most definitely on social media. Why? Because that will become a source of torture for you. The narcissist will leverage social media and all those people against you. And if you're in that phase where you're stalking and going online and you're obsessed with finding out what's going on, you're going to see their posts and it's just going to drive you insane. You've got to opt out of that by going no contact with all those flying monkeys. I wouldn't just delete them off your friends list. I would block them so that you set yourself up for success. The so that you don't even tempt yourself to go look and then go down that downward spiral and get derailed for days from your projects, from your energy, from feeling good. Another suggestion is don't try to convince them the truth. People are going to see what they want to see. If they are believing in the narcissist, the naive just don't get it. They just don't see it and you trying to convince them of the truth is not going to help. That never works. Not one time that I tried, it never worked. Your true friends are going to recognize it. They're going to stand by you. They're not going to question you. They're going to have your back right away. The other group of people, the toxic people, you definitely don't want to try and convince them of the truth because they don't want to hear the truth. They're getting something out of that relationship with the narcissist. So don't try to convince them. It's going to be a huge waste of your energy and probably what's going to happen at the end of that conversation or that attempt to convince somebody is that you're going to feel even more doubtful about yourself. You're going to doubt your reality. It's going to be hard to be assertive and own your reality. Sometimes there are situations where you can't go entirely no contact with the flying monkeys. Say it's a roommate, it's someone that you live with, say it's someone in a closed community. They're part of your church, they're part of your school, they're part of some group of people that you can't cut out. Maybe you're still at the job and you can't leave the job yet because you don't have a new job lined up. Be careful not to share personal information with the flying monkeys. You want the absolute minimum contact with the flying monkeys in these cases. Share nothing personal, just talk about the weather. Talk about sports, talk about something absolutely meaningless. Whatever you talk about, be sure it doesn't have any kind of emotional connection to you or reveal anything personal about your life. They would use all of that against you and, and all of that will get back to the narcissist, which will then have a double impact on you. And finally, when possible, move away. If this is your next door neighbor, if this is someone in a small community, move away from there, get away from there. If it is in your immediate environment like that, for example, if you're in a work situation, you can manage this for a period of time. You can learn how to grow better boundaries, how to set and enforce boundaries, how to respond versus react. But that's a temporary solution. You don't want to stay there for too long. You don't want to keep that job long term. Start looking for another job, quietly of course. Definitely don't tell anyone in that office. 
Not even someone you think is your ally who might accidentally reveal that information to the wrong person. Get a new job as soon as possible so you get out of that environment as soon as possible. Because managing all those boundaries and being on guard on a daily basis is going to drain a lot of energy that you could be investing in other areas of your life. And finally, I just want to give you guys a benefit. The smear campaign is devastating. Dealing with flying monkeys is horrible. I'm sure there are a lot of people who have committed suicide because there is a whole group of people against them and they just felt so invalidated, so alone, so deeply doubting themselves that they couldn't find a reason to go on. They didn't find a way out. They didn't even know what was happening. It can be that serious. The benefit of the horror of this whole experience is that you learn who your true friends and allies are. Maybe you didn't even know who they really are. Life has a way of revealing people over time and it may not be today but at some point people will reveal themselves to you. At the very least be grateful that these people revealed themselves to you. They showed you that they are not your friends. Now that you know this, you no longer trust them. You're no longer sharing with them and giving energy to them. Now that you know not to go there for friendship, for loyalty and for trust. So if you've been through this experience of dealing with flying monkeys, or if you're going through this experience right now, if something in this article helped you, let me know. In the